Hello, Nigeria. Thank you for joining us for another episode of Newsline. I am Jennifer Igwe. Now, the emotional, physical, and psychological harm of torture can linger in a person's life for very long. So it is crucial for the society to assist victims of torture, get redress, and rehabilitation. Importantly, perpetrators must answer to the law. Our story on a 12-year-old victim of torture sheds more light. Now, the news of the murder of a young job seeker was heart-wrenching. Although her life was painfully cut short, the full wrath of the law is said to descend on her killer, an alleged rapist. Then the spiritual and social impact of Salah celebrations and how Muslim faithful celebrated it is on our lineup. Then the breathtaking and fun-filled excitement of Doba events or reflection of our cultural heritage are all on cue. I'll pause here though so we can take the news first. Elizabeth Omori is on standby in Abuja. Elizabeth, it's over to you. And like we say in Nigeria, happy Sunday. Happy Sunday to you as well, Jennifer. Thank you so much for joining us on the new segment of the program. President Mohamed Buhari is about now arriving in Paris, the French capital, ahead of the France African Finance Summit. President Mohamed Buhari was seen off in Abuja earlier today by the Minister of the FCT, Mohamed Musa Bello. Chief of Staff to the President, Professor Ibrahim Gambari, Acting Inspector General of Police, Husman Al Kalibaba, Director General, Department of State Services, and other senior government officials. The summit will focus on reviewing African economy following shocks from coronavirus pandemic and getting relief, especially from increased debt burden on countries. President Emmanuel Macron is to host the summit, which is expected to draw major stakeholders in the global finance institutions. Participating heads of government are to collectively discuss external funding and debt treatment for Africa and private sector reforms. Now to security matters, the strike by Nigeria Labour Congress over workers' sack in Kaduna State takes its toll on the people with electricity supply, disruption and lull in social and economic activities. Abdullah Suleiman Rigachukun has an update. Hours to the commencement of the strike in compliance with the directive by organized labour, electricity employees knocked down the 33 kVA transmission line of power resulting in power outage in Kaduna metropolis and environs. Well, here we are at Kabala Kostin, one of the densely populated areas in Kaduna metropolis. And we have been speaking to many people on their experience on this power outage that the city has started experiencing. And uh, standing with me to shed more light on this experience is Muhammad Tahir. Sir, how has the situation been? We are definitely frustrated. Because uh, most of us, you can see, we are outside, there is no light. Uh, those who have access to refrigerators, all their food stock have been perished. Around that can seven, then they take off the light. Often now, no light. The effect of the plant shut down by NLC tomorrow is not only on power outage, it is also taking its toll on filling stations where we have seen long queues of vehicles. How long have you been on the queue? Uh, last two hours. The main point is for them to come together and resolve the issue so that we poor masses will be able to survive. Stakeholders have intensified call on government and organized labor to dialogue for amicable resolution. Suleiman Abdullah Hirgachikung, NTA News. Kaduna State Police Command has apprehended five suspected rail truck vandals at Dali Village in Jema local government area and recovered two trucks loaded with locomotive railway sleepers. A statement by the command public relations officer, ASP Mohamed Jalige, says the suspects are currently undergoing interrogation and efforts have been intensified with a view to identifying all those involved in the destruction of critical national infrastructure. The police therefore advised the general public to disregard the video in circulation, attributing the vandalism to the Abuja Kaduna rail track as the two incidents have no direct link. 
Still on security, the effort to flush out criminal elements in Imo State is taking a new dimension as the State Police Command has relaunched the Special Police Squad, Operation Search and Flush. Obiano Jukmo also reports that the State Commissioner of Police, Abutu Yaro, who assured that the team has been equipped with necessary tools, urged the officers to be professional in the discharge of their assignment. Going by the recent security challenges in Imo State, security agencies have continued to evolve ways of tackling the situation. The relaunch of Operation Search and Flush by the Imo State Police Command is therefore one of the latest efforts aimed at ending the series of attacks on government and private facilities. The Commissioner of Police, Imo State Command, Abutu Yaro, notes that the team has been equipped to achieve maximum results. He urges them to be professional in the discharge of their assignment and eschew all forms of compromise, stressing that their purpose is to ensure restoration of peace and security in the state. You must comport yourself, you must be compliant with the tenets of operating in an ICT era. There must be decency, there must be comportment, there must be professionalism, and there must be maturity. While warning that no form of cowardice will be acceptable, the CP enjoins leaders of the teams not to deviate from their mandate in order to achieve the desired results. The activities of the tactical team is expected to cut across the 27 local government areas of Imo State. In Oware, Obiano Nujumosu, NTN News. Still talking security, the proliferation of light and small arms within Nigeria has continued to be the bane of ongoing efforts to end insurgency, banditry and other related crimes bedeviling the country. The fight against the old trend has however recorded a huge success recently with the arrest of a notorious gun runner from the Nigeria Republic. Jamilu Ibrahim has the details. One of the states of the Federation was hit by the problem in recent years, which obviously makes the ongoing fight against armed banditry, kidnapping and cattle wrestling bedeviling the state seemingly interminable. Despite the various measures taken to check the proliferation of the firearms and to disarm those who illegally possess them, the ugly trend appears to have continued unabated. The recent arrest of a 30-year-old Nigerian who allegedly specializes in supplying firearms to bandits in Zamfara and some other neighboring states is a clear testimony to that. He was arrested at Gada, local government area of South Coast State, by a combined team of policemen. The notorious Gorona was arrested alongside some other suspected armed bandit campings who have been allegedly terrorizing communities in Zamfara, Kasina, Kaduna, Niger, and Kogi states over the years. I sell the rifles and ammunitions to bandits at their various enclaves, especially in Zamfara and Niger states. The suspect claims that he imports the deadly weapons to Nigeria with the support of a military personnel who gives him a cover at any security checkpoint. Adding that, he purchases the rifles and ammunition from some two dealers residing in the Niger Republic. Zamfara State Police Command assures that the notorious gun runner will face the full rise of the law. In Gusau, Jamilu Ibrahim, NTA News. No fewer than 22 underage girls allegedly brought to Ogun State from Akwaibam State by two child traffickers for prostitution have been rescued at a brothel by the Ogun State Police Command and handed over to the National Agency for the Prohibition of Trafficking in Persons, NAPTIP, for further investigation. Yemi Dalimo reports. The girls who are between the ages of 10 and 14 were allegedly brought to Lagos by a suspected child trafficker under the pretense of providing job for them at a restaurant as sale agents so that they can be sending money to their parents in Aqua Ibom State as a way of rendering financial assistance. However, upon their arrival in Lagos, they were brought to a hotel in Italiota, Ogun State and lured into prostitution where their mobile phones were seized to discourage them from contacting any of their relatives. Receiving information on the illegal activities of the traffickers, Songwata Divisional Command of the Ogun State Police Command swung into action and rescued 22 underage girls at the hotel. We were able to arrest the manager of the hotel and some other uh, suspects that were met in that uh, particular place. Some of the victims who claim to be orphans say they are ready to start a new life. I 
at him and say, look at you, I look at father, look at, look at mother. Why do you carry me to go? I should come and do this one. He tell me, don't worry. Girls and the two suspected child traffickers were later handed over to the officials of the National Agency for the Prohibition of Trafficking in Persons, Lagos Kuzola Command, for further investigation on the matter. Ogunse Police Command and NAPTI say effective collaboration among security agencies will put an end to cases of child trafficking in Nigeria. In Abelkuta, Jemi Dalimo, NTA News. Advocacy against child abuse and gender-based violence has once again been brought to the fore as Catholic women in Abuja converged on the Pitan Paul Parish Nyanya to celebrate 110 years' existence of the World Union of Catholic Women's Organization. Charles Arthur reports that the Minister of Women Affairs was at the parish to identify with the women. A milestone achievement of motherhood, a reminder of the vital roles women play in the society and the need to refocus and intensify awareness against all forms of child abuse and gender-based violence characterize the celebration of a centenary and a decade of the World Union of Catholic Women's Organization at the Peter and Paul Parish, Nyanya Abuja. Today is a very, very significant day in the life of the women. From the pulpits, the message was clear. The unity of all and sundry is sacrosanct and must be upheld at all costs. And women in this regard are considered vital change agents. We we'll give glory and thanks to Almighty God that all this while the women have been carrying the church along and the women have done extremely well. And today there's nothing we can do than to celebrate. For the Minister of Women Affairs, Dame Pauline Tallinn, gender inequality and violence have eroded societal values. And parents, in this regard, she said, oh, it's a duty to provide their children moral education and care for their needs. When you see something, you say something. Watch out for the signs in your home. Because a rapist is not a stranger. A rapist is always somebody within the family or within the neighborhood. So we have to do everything possible to protect the girl child. Not even the girl child, the boys. Catholic women from various parishes who were part of the celebration, used the day to remember colleagues who lost their lives fighting the cause of women. In Abuja, Charles Alpha, NTA News. The Catholic Church in Nigeria has used the occasion of this year's World Communications Day to send an advisory message to internet users, especially in Nigeria. At the commemoration mass which held at the Catholic Cup Secretariat of Nigeria, Abuja, the Catholic Church admonished internet users to refrain from using their mobile phones for spreading fake news. Ekene Unduli tells us more. The continuing threat of hate speech and fake news proliferation in Nigeria has been a source of great public concern. This is because of its threat to peace, unity, stability and corporate existence of the country. To check the trend, the federal government has invested billions of money in enlightenment and advocacy campaigns. The Catholic Church has now raised the bar in this advocacy against his speech and fake news. In its World Communication Day message, the church frowned at what it called armchair journalism and nudged journalists to always make efforts to verify information they disseminate. We want to encourage in Nigeria, come and see model of journalism. Somebody on the spot, empathic journalist that will report events, actual events, because the person was there to see the events and get feel the, the pulse of the people. Anybody who really wants to be rich, uh, journalism may be the last uh, career he may choose. Because journalism is not just a career, it is actually a call, a vocation, a ministry. It wasn't all hard knocks on journalists. The presiding bishop at the mass, Bishop Dennis Isuzo, appreciated journalists for sacrifices they make as watchdog of the society. Bishop Isuzo also admonished Nigerians to show greater responsibility in the use of the internet by desisting from spreading unverified information. In Abuja, Ekene Ndulwe, NTA News. Activities marking the 57th anniversary of the Nigerian Air Force 
have continued with an interdenominational church service at the Air Force Base Abuja. The crux of the seven are the service hinged on the finding on finding individual and national identity for peace, unity, and patriotism. Defense correspondent Najat Tijani reports. For 57 years, the Nigerian Air Force has been known to defend the nation's airspace. Although the changing nature of security threats has necessitated certain changes in its strategy, its identity as the nation's air power still remains. This identity has been the unifying factor in joint security operations, a fact which is being celebrated at this interdenominational service marking the 57th anniversary of the force. No wonder the sermon taken from Matthew chapter 16 verses 13 to 20 hinges on the message, Who do people say I am? The question Jesus asked his disciples. We are a family. The Air Force is a family. And we have to know ourselves. We have to identify ourselves. We have to say who he is. In its 57 years of service, the Nigerian Air Force has made strides in several areas, including the induction and reactivation of aircraft, the commencement of in-country periodic depot maintenance, and the winging of several pilots, including female fighter pilots. We have been able to support the ground troops in all their operations, and we have also carried out independent operations, and, uh, which have had a lot of success. Other activities lined up to mark the anniversary include seminars, medical outreaches and the inauguration of a telemedicine center in line with COVID-19 protocols. In the meantime, the Nigerian Air Force is calling on all Nigerians to identify as patriots and support its mission of defending the nation's territorial integrity. Naja Atutijani, NTA News. Let's now take you to Bauchi State, where the state's primary health care development agency has commenced the administration of the second dose of the COVID-19 vaccine, with a call on the people to continue observing the non-pharmaceutical preventive measures. Mahmoud Ibn Mohammed reports. Having already vaccinated over 47,000 people with the AstraZeneca COVID vaccine, Bochi State has recorded over 80% success in the first phase of the exercise. The guidelines worldwide is to receive the second dose between 3 to 12 weeks. And the longer you stay before receiving the second dose, the more protection you will receive according to the available studies. Appeal to most to our people, to the population in Bochi State, not to be complacent in the sense that to think that COVID-19 has passed. No, we are still with COVID-19. Nine weeks since the administration of the first job, the state primary health care development agency has begun administering the second dose of the vaccine with Governor Bala Muhammad, his wife, the state deputy governor, some senior citizens and frontline workers. Uh, the response that we have gotten in terms of uh, percentage is very encouraging. We want to call on the federal government to work with the states to make sure whatever needs to be done is done to deploy resources to procure these vaccines for total coverage of our citizenry. We have to know that the vaccines are not a perfect fix for COVID-19 for COVID infection. We still, still need to practice other precautions like wearing masks, social distancing and washing until public health officials to say otherwise. With only 14 cases so far under management, the state has recorded only 540 cases this year with no casualty in Bauchi. Mahmoud Ibn Muhammad, NTA News. In time to talk sports, our sportsman Badi Adelaide will be our guide. Badi. Many thanks, Elizabeth. Super Eagles captain Ahmed Musa recorded an assist as he made his second debut for Kano Pillars in the Nigeria Professional Football League on Sunday. Musa set up Rabiu Ali for the winning goal in their one nil triumph over Damawa United in a Week 21 encounter played at the Madu Bello Stadium, Kaduna. Aqua United are still atop the, the league standings after defeating local rivals Dakada 2 0 in Oyo. Quara United returned to win ways with a 2-0 home win against Plateau United, with Rivers United beating Enugu Rangers 1-0 in Enugu. 
There were also wins for MFM, Luby Stars, Nasarawa United and Heartland, while Sunshine Stars and Jigawa Golden Stars settled for a goalless draw. Meanwhile, Nigeria's last surviving representatives in the CAF Confederation Cup in Yumba, their hopes of advancing to the quarterfinals suffered a huge blow as they were beaten from one away to pyramids of Egypt. Victor Mboma had shot the People's Elephants into the lead as early as the first minute, but their shambolic defending saw them concede four goals. The second leg comes up in Aba next Sunday. Let's hope Enyimba can overturn that. Away to England now, as a sensational injury time header from Liverpool goalkeeper Alison Becker helped the Reds snatch a 2-1 win away to West Brom at the death on Sunday, while also keeping alive the top four hopes of the dethroned Premier League champions. Tottenham moved to sixth on the log after recording a convincing 2 0 win at home to Wolverhampton Wanderers, while Crystal Palace came from behind twice to beat Aston Villa 3-2 at Sellers Park with the match between Everton and already relegated Sheffield United ending 1-0 in favor of the Blades. Let's move to Spain now as Luis Suarez scored a dramatic late winner as Atletico Madrid fought back to beat Osasuna 2-1 on Sunday and put themselves on the verge of a forced La Liga title in seven years. Diego Simeone's men now need a win in their final game against Real Valladolid to clinch the title. Real Madrid kept the pressure on their city rivals with a hard-fought winning win over Athletic Bilbao while Barcelona were out of the title race after losing one to at home to Celta Vigo. There were wins for Alaves, Auchi, Valencia and Villarreal. Two men's football now, the final of the UEFA Women's Champions League between Chelsea and Barcelona is currently ongoing with Barcelona making a minced meet of the Blues at the moment. The last time we checked the scoreline, it was 4-0 in favor of Barca ladies. And let's let you know that Super Falcons captain Asizat Oshuala has been able to shrug off an ankle injury to be named on the bench. Back home, Nigeria Seniola Bolaji made history as the first African to qualify for the final and win gold at a major para badminton international championship earlier today. She achieved the defeat by beating Ukraine's Oksana Kuzina 18 to 21 in the first set. She lost that 21 to 14 in the second set, and she won again the third set 21 to 18 at the 2021 Spanish para badminton championship. And finally, Tyson Fury has confirmed he will fight Nigerian-born British boxer Anthony Joshua in Saudi Arabia on August 14 as he tries to become the undisputed heavyweight champion of the world. Fury has promised it will be the biggest sporting event to grace the planet Earth. Uh, August 14th, 2021, summertime. All of the world will be on the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia and I cannot wait, repeat, cannot wait to smash Anthony Joshua on the biggest stage of all times. This is going to be the biggest sporting event ever to grace the planet Earth. Do not miss it. All eyes on us. Peace out. God bless. Well, we get to know maybe talk is cheap on August 14. Before we go, let's let you know that the governor of Delta State, Ifayo Kowa, has dissolved the management and technical crew of Warrior Wolves. They are currently 18th on the log in the Nigeria Professional Football League. And that's pause for now. It's back to Elizabeth. Thank you so much, buddy. Time now to take a look at what the weather would look like tomorrow, Monday. Adi could join us. Monday morning is expected to be mostly cloudy over most places within the country, with prospects of few thunderstorms over Taraba, the southeastern region, such as Calabar, Eket, Yenigua, and Port Harcourt, are also expected to experience isolated cases of thunderstorms. The afternoon is where we have better prospects of thunderstorms, which is expected to affect the coastal areas extending to the inland cities of the south. There are equally prospects of thunderstorms over the central region, most especially parts of the FCT, Plateau, Nasarawa, and Niger State. These storms are also expected to extend to the northeastern parts of the country, such as Gombe Bauchi, Adamawa, and southern Taraba in the evening. Stay tuned for the temperature details. I am Joyce Ogunle.
you can get more news and updates on www.nta.ng or follow us on our Twitter handle at NTA News Now. You can also like us on Facebook at www.facebook forward slash NTA Network News. And also stay connected and subscribe to our YouTube channel at www.youtube.com forward slash NTA News Online. Also remember to watch our news live streaming at www.nta.ng forward slash live. In that instant news segment of the program, Jennifer will be back with more reports after this break to stay with us. Welcome. Now, against social media speculative reports, more revelations are emerging in regards to the circumstances that led to the death of a 26-year-old job seeker in Akwaibom State, the late Inyobong Umorin. In the latest development, the suspect who fled to Calabar has been nabbed, and in public glare, he confessed he had raped six girls and that he killed Um Imore in self-defense. Clement Barikwe, who has been following the unfortunate development for Newsline, brings us an update. The sad story about Inyobong Moren's death made news after her friend raised alarm on Twitter on April 30 that Ini was missing after going for a job interview. The deceased had gone online on April 27 to appeal for job, but unfortunately fell in wrong hands. Soon after the suspect was arrested by the police, what followed were a series of different write-ups. The social media took the lead. First was an online video claiming the suspect, Udok Frank Akpan, was a serial rapist and ritualist who specialized in selling human parts and that his family compound were filled with shallow graves of his victims. This, the police say, is not true. Things that look like uh, holes where they dug up yam as being, are, are referred to as uh, shallow grave. There are no shallow graves anywhere. There are no bones anywhere. That is the truth. Uh, but if anybody can show me any shallow grave there, it, you should go and show me, but I know there are no shallow graves. We went through the ground properly. The suspect admitted to have raped six girls and never killed any of them, except in Yobon, whom he claimed died out of self-defense. Okay. Killed. I've not killed anybody. She's the only one I've killed. In a bid to stop her, I used the stabilizer to hit her. And when I hit her, she fell and started bleeding. Then, then, then after she died. I'm, I'm, I'm not happy about what my child has done. I don't even believe this can happen to me. After I, I send them to school, try to bring them up. Nyobong's corpse has been buried within the week at her hometown in Nurugunam local government area. <laughs> She, she was someone of goodwill, a jolly good fellow. I was expecting to come for a marriage. I did not expect to come for a burial. But she gained admission more than four times, but there was no money to proceed. So she had to go back to teaching to be able to raise funds to go to, you know, pay acceptance fee and all that. For the police, the case continues until all investigations are concluded and the matter charged to courts. <laughs> Unfortunately, Umore is not alive to narrate what happened. That said, justice must be served. Now, women as mothers are expected to be caring to children, whether they are theirs biologically or not. Sometimes strange things happen, and one wonders how cruel human beings can be. 
This was the case when Joy, a 12-year-old, was caged and starved for over eight months by her guardians in Sokoto. Zainab Seydou Abdul Nasir tells us more. Mr. and Mrs. Basi, Emmanuel, and their children moved into this one room at the Sokoto Cinema area in Sokoto North local government over eight months ago. But Mrs. Esther Emmanuel refused to relate with any of her neighbors, so no one knew about 12-year-old Joy until a strange thing happened. Children were playing and they mistakenly fall on the cage where she was being kept. And the cage happens to open. So, and we now saw the girl and we started taking the immediate action by reporting to the appropriate authority. 12-year-old Joy Emmanuel had been caged on top of a condemned freezer in a zinc house for over eight months and she had been starved. There's a long since the first day that we pack and come there. There's where I used to sleep on top of the fridge outside there. And they now close it and the place there's no window, nothing, nothing. The place is just closed. With the discovery of joy by the neighbors, they reported the case. The police swung into action and the suspects were arrested. All the stakeholders in the child protection sector were present at the scene of the inhuman act. The cruelty to the young girls is so much that uh, you cannot even believe it, that human beings can behave like that and can treat another human being like that. They are always ready to partner with the police in order to um, make sure the justice has been done. And um, on the issue of victim, we will partner with the um, Ministry of um, uh, women and Children Affairs to um, cater for the welfare of the, of the survival. We'll take care of her medication and uh, we will collaborate with the police to ensure that they punish this, this thing and maybe take them to court for prosecution and we will follow it. Mrs. Esther Emanuel claims that Joy Emanuel is mentally ill. That was why she had been caging her. Joy had been taken to the specialist hospital Sokoto as the state government had taken responsibility for her treatment and ensure that she is properly recuperated. The police says proper investigations have commenced to identify the real parents of Joy and the suspects will be prosecuted to serve as a deterrent to others engaged in similar inhuman acts. <laughs> Man's inhumanity to man. The wrath of the law should well apply in this case. Now, children are God's heritage, and their arrival and families are often seen as blessings. For the Wadamosi family of Akpata area of Ibadan, the arrival of the baby has brought untold pains to their lives due to the poorly managed birth complications that has resulted in a painful twist in the young Iyano Lua's destiny. Kemi Oshie brings us details of the baby whose right arm had to be amputated at nine weeks old to save her life. Viewers' discretion is hereby advised. For 30-year-old Blessing and her husband, Sunday Gbadamosi, 24th of February 2021 would have been a day to remember joyfully if they had taken advantage of the various enlightenment program of government and relevant stakeholders on ensuring maternal and child health. But according to the couple, Lack of funds informed their choices. I take my baby to traditional place. So she tied my she tied a hand. She spoiled my baby hand. So after doing it, after they did it, after two days, we saw the hand was swelling up. We took her there. After we took her there, then we found out that they they losing the 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 bandage from it. So we found out that the hand was now like decaying. The painful story of beautiful baby Yanolu Agbadamosi first made the news a few weeks back when she was taken to the University College Hospital, UCH Ibado, with a withered right arm. At about nine weeks old, due to multiple fractures sustained on the arm during her delivery, 
She then needed urgent financial assistance to facilitate the amputation of her arm, which has been damaged by quack traditional bone setter to avoid Yanolua losing her life. Timely intervention of good-spirited Nigerians and the Medical Social Works Department of UCH, however, made the initial surgery possible. Because they didn't have money, no antenatal care, they didn't even pay for the delivery she did for them. The local bone setters came in one day or the other. From the one, the, the baby has been on custard. And then, and then pap, from day one, she could not breastfeed, she could not, um, so we, we felt that the patient will need a lot of original rehabilitation. On a visit to the baby at the hospital, after the surgery, NTA crew met her sleeping peacefully, which is no doubt indicative of the fact that the treatment has given her relief from the initial pains of the gangrened arm. But the lingering question is... What happens to the lasting pain of a life without a right arm? Prosthesis available which she can use depending on the degree of financial support that she has. However, there will be challenges because as she grows, the prosthesis is supposed to be identical to the other arm, so it's not so obvious. That means that she will need to regularly keep changing the prosthesis to bigger ones that will match the size of the other arm as she grows. The other problem is that the muscles around the shoulder, because they are not being used, they will shrink in size. We call that atrophy. They will atrophy and so that shoulder and the very likely that half of the chest will be a bit smaller in size than the other. While wishing that the badamosis had gone to the hospital on time, one will also sincerely hope that the necessary assistance come the way of this innocent child. Yeah, I mean, that's, so, that's really touching. Kind donations will go a long way in assisting the baby and the family. Let's reach out to them. Time for a break now. Newsline will continue shortly. Stay with us. Ovaltine 3 in 1. Smart choice for smart kids. In my house, we may look alike, but we are very different individuals. Everybody believes their way is best. That's why Golden Penny Pasta is our favorite meal. Golden Penny Pasta, made with drum weight, is tasty, nutritious, a source of protein and fiber, and non-sticky. So you can cook, serve, and eat your Pasta, just the way you like it. With Golden Penny Pasta, your way is best. Cause I'm the new best thing. I'm the new best thing. Better than you've ever seen. I'm the Discover new, new Guinness Smooth. Perfectly balanced for a smooth, refreshing taste. Yeah, I'm the new best thing. You don't do wait for him. <laughs> The dying minute of the football season, where they come with extra, extra drama. Better heartbreak. And the victory when you go to tell your picking, and your picking, picking them. But anyhow, we take happen, we take Gidiba with our team. Now for life. Make sense with this, and you know fit me, sir. Stay connected on top your go TV. Make yourself see all the bass goes with the shell alive this whole month of May. As for bosses in don't enter final lap, go TV. Love it. Nigerian youths are about the greatest assets the country has at the moment. It is therefore not surprising that the administration of President Muhammad Buhari is strategically responding to the yearnings of the youth. 
through multiple projects and programs. Youth Entrepreneurship Support Years by Bank of Industry, the Youth Investment Fund by the CBN, and several other conditional cash transfer programs. Recruitment of 774,000 social workers, majority of whom are youths, and so many other projects that are beneficial to youths directly or indirectly. If the administration can do all this, definitely with a degree of patience and time, it can achieve more. Nigerian youths must come together to say no to terrorism, no to vandalism, and no to all disruptive tendencies. Hashtag Youth for Greater Nigeria, pacifying the youths, unifying the nation. Welcome back. Now the 2021 Eid al Fitri celebrations was marked, which marked the end of Ramadan, was a window for the people of Basa, a community in Guagualada Area Council of the Federal Capital Territory, to showcase their cultural heritage. Adebola Brooklyn Sunday joined them from the Eid praying ground to the Agumas Palace in Guagualada Area Council, where the people celebrated Salah using their culture. The day's event began with a Turaka prayer at the Eid ground after the 30 days Ramadan fast when those who participated denied themselves of any liquid, food or sexual activities from sunrise to sunset. As Muslims globally mark the end of the month's long spiritual exercise, Guagolada Area Council came alive as members of Aguma Kingdom celebrate the Eid Fitri Day culturally. From all works of life, they converged on the palace after hours of procession. The young, the old, title holders, and other groups took turns to pay homage to their king as religious leaders led the people in prayers for a peaceful and prosperous Nigeria. The Aguma of Guagualada, who said the entire people of the community are his family members, reminded them of the dangers of not adhering to preventive protocols as handed down by the Presidential Steering Committee on COVID-19. I'm so happy because last year we didn't have an opportunity to host this. So this year, we thank God, we witness and we celebrate this Salah festival. It's signifying peace, it's signifying unity, it's, it's signifying togetherness and the strength of the power lies on, on the hands of the people. The Aguma's immediate family also joined him in the palace for the celebration. Having fasted for 30 days and prayed seriously, I would really appreciate if God accepts our Ibadah. One of the take-homes from the celebration is the need for the people to continue to live in peace with one another. Let everybody keep any personal interest. Let us work for the progress of the country and the FCT so that things will move forward. Amatawale, as you all know, is a bridge builder between the youth and the elders. So if there is any information, any enlightenment, in the palace, it's my responsibility to reach out to them, to enlighten them on the do's and don'ts. The Aguma and his family then proceeded to the special cultural ground for Tibara, a show of power by the Basa people. <laughs> The big band, which is called the Salah, was formed specially for kings. When I see stabs for an empty, I say, oh no, oh no, I can't just bail out how I'm feeling today. Too much excited. I'm very, very happy. This ethnic group 
which is found in Africa, especially in Egypt, Liberia, Cameroon, and some Nigerian states, including Abuja, the Federal Capital Territory, are great lovers of culture and have a well-established political system even before the advent of colonialism. Interesting cultural event there. Now, what has the celebration of Salah got to do with coconut? Absolutely nothing, you may say, in which case I will say you are not absolutely right. In Kano, a particular community has so much popularized coconut trade fair during its prayers that theirs is referred to as Eden Kwakwa a house of coinage that means the Eid of Coconut. Let our correspondent Aminu Uma guide us through this fun-packed celebration of Eid. Uh, this is uh, the Watiki Eid praying ground. It's a place where two Eids are always observed on every Eid day. Uh, the first one is the Eid we know that is two rakats, uh, Eid prayer at the end of every fasting season. But the other one is called Eid Kwakwa. Eid Kwakwa literally refers to as coconut Eid. Observance of two units Eid prayer in congregations is no doubt the attraction that preoccupies hearts of Muslims as they troop to their chosen prayer grounds on Salah days. Here in the Watiki, however, there is additional attraction that has long socio-cultural undertone. It is the third fair of coconut as coconut sellers converge on praying ground immediately after it to display their goods in fair-like manner. <laughs> If you can observe very well, coconut take the largest share of all that is in this place. Buyers who are mostly youth of all genders take advantage to patronize the abundant coconut, which is naturally scarce and costly in a place where it is not grown. It is grown elsewhere but celebrated here. This is why they call it eating kwakwa in their local parlance, meaning the eat of coconut. The doing the yezu masala ching. The idea is that we be jigidar ita go to eating it. If jigidar jigidar ita shima onu loka ching. Everyone that comes to this eat returns from with coconut, and that attracts others as well. Kasa muma tasa de ya arada mata. You know, youth like things like that, and coconut is abundant here. We come to this place just to buy coconut and nothing more. Coconut Fair or Idun Kwakwa holds twice a year during the Eids of Al Fitri and Eid al Kabir. It comes with its unique and symbolic values, symbolizing different things to different people. It is recreational to some while commercial to others. You know, youths like a creation and they find it here. Some youths prefer attending Eden Kwakwa for the simple reasons from abundant shadow from Nim Tree that abound in the arena. To the customary delay in observance of prayer, which simply saves latecomers from missing prayers. Beyond that, it also provides an avenue for girls and boys to catch new friends and suitors. I caught five boyfriends just today. Observers believe if avenues like these are well managed, they can engage youth into meaningful ventures and divert their attention from indulging in activities inimical to their well-being. Now, fun field and interesting indeed. Now, if there are activities that can be used to promote national unity, considering the diverse backgrounds of the Nigerian citizens, then cultural and religious festivals may be one of them. Mohammed Musa Askira reports on how this year's Idil Fitri horse procession by the Emir of Dutse in Jigawa State strengthened the bond of friendship and brotherhood. The horses procession popularly known as Daba is being celebrated in Dutse Emirates in three phases with each having a whole day dedicated to it. These processions last for two days after the Eid al-Fitr prayer was observed. <laughs> 
First Lady Emery Tansu the Palace on horseback in the company of hundreds of other horse riders appeared in a colorful traditional attires to the admiration of his subjects. The procession, a carnival-like, is usually arranged in the order of hierarchy amongst the council members of the Emirate. <laughs> In the second phase, the Emir pays homage to the state governor in company of all districts and village heads, among other title holders in the Emirates. <laughs> Interestingly, the Emir also tours the state capital, acknowledging cheers from the residents as he rides on the streets in the city. <laughs> that is the long-standing tradition in the Emirates. However, there is a silent benefit in this kind of event that attracts people from all walks of life despite their religious or ethnic backgrounds, just to catch a glimpse at the elegant display of culture. Among those that grace the festival are the members of the southern parts of the country community in duty who see to the fact that this event indeed foster unity amongst Nigerians. <laughs> We thank our traditional leaders for the prayers they make for God to grant us peace in this country. May God grant us peace and prosperity in Jigawa and Nigeria as a whole. The happiness is everywhere. So this is an important milestone for us. And also this is showing to us that there is peace and security in Jigawa. Jigawa happened to be one of the most peaceful states. And that unity and peace and stability that we have in Jigawa does not happen without the commitment of our responsible leader, the governor of the state, and the support of the traditional institution. We are partners in solidarity. We are partners in peace and unity of this state and this country generally. And anybody that in any way, in any place that is calling for the disunity of this country, we are unanimously saying that we are not part of it and we will not be part of it. We say united we stand, divided we fall. So there is need for unity for us to stand in Nigeria. And that's what we have been praying, that God will grant us that unity. Indeed, in this gathering of people from within and outside Jigao State, one sees nothing but peace and love for one another. Diverse culture and tradition promotes love and unity. Now the lessons of unity and peaceful coexistence preached during the month of Ramadan played out in the Salah festivals that climaxed the season in Gumbi. Emmanuel Akila recaps the glamour of the Adel Fitri celebrations in Gumbi State. In his report, he tags religion and culture recipe for unity and peaceful living. The Eid prayers herald the moments the people await during Salah. The ancient practice of the royalty, meeting with the people at the palace, makes an arena of the high and the low in the society, attracted by the heroic and majestic show by horse riders. On Salah Day, the Emirate Council plays host to the government. Next is a return homage by the royal contingent to the government. The Emir of Gombe, Al Haj Abu Bakr Sheikh Abu Bakr III, leads the way. The royalty and the government both point to their synergy in the duty of safeguarding the lives and property of the people as the enabler of the peaceful atmosphere which allows for the celebration. The essence of this Hawan uh, Delshi is for His Royal Highness, the Emir of Gombe, and indeed the entire traditional institution to come and show solidarity with the government and by extension with the government of the Federal Republic of Nigeria under Mr. President Muhammad Buhari. And we thank God, it went very well and we are happy. We pray that Allah will make us see this day again. 
again next year, inshallah. The colorful traditional dresses and the spectacular horse riding depicts the royalty and dignity of the Bubo Yoro dynasty in Gombe State. You know, it is uh, one of the dynasties that you can be proud of in terms of tradition, in terms of anything you think of traditionally in the um, in the in the uh, in terms of a traditional uh, institution in this country. We have riding horses to government house to come and greet the governor of Gombe State together with our area. Alhamdulillah, mashallah, no any problem. Without my neighbor, today is another good day that I've seen Nigeria. Nigeria is one. We what is happening? We see that Nigeria will pray for the peace and the peace that we're enjoying in Gobe. Said as a whole, for you to enjoy in Nigeria, general. The director general of the NTA was also in Gombe to share in the joy of the holiday. Uh, this is a period of, uh, of celebration after, after 30 days of fasting, 30 days of uh, supplication, 30 days of closeness to the Almighty. This is a period of celebration on my behalf. On behalf of the management and the entire workforce of NTA, I wish the good people of Gombe State happy Eid al Fitri. The government and the traditional institution exchange gifts to demonstrate the unity between the two institutions a show of the prevailing peace in the state to the admiration of their guests from within and outside the state. Full events there. Now, as the legacy of intangible attributes and physical artifacts of a group or society inherited from one generation Cultural heritage is maintained in the present and bestowed for the benefit of the future generations. For the people of Bauchi, sustaining the century-long traditional Saladoba, otherwise known as Hawan Bariki, is a collective responsibility of both the government, traditional institution, and the people. Mahmoud Ibn Muhammad captured the sights and sounds of this year's Doba for Newsline. It was a day full of pomp and ceremony as the indigents came out in droves to celebrate their rich cultural heritage, alternatively referred to as Hawambariki. It's so beautiful. The people dress well. And look at how the horses even were dressed like human beings. So I think uh, it's all okay. We thank Almighty God. The culture that remains unadulterated. So we're trying as much as we can to preserve it, to introduce the younger ones, to be copying with us. We copy from our, 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 our fathers and the forefathers. A magnificent and thrilling event with thousands of elaborately adorned and decorated horses and equally adorned horse riders in their traditional regalia. Each group and district were ably represented, while some groups carried along different types of animals. Very high regard for the traditional institutions. Uh, people respect the traditional institutions. They are the last port of call. This is the only time we make merry. Uh, people are generally farmers, and they are living in the rural areas. This is the time that traditionally, over 100 years, they come to the city, interact with their kids and kin, and then go going back happy. A long-established tradition, the Daba has been practiced for over a hundred years in the northern part of Nigeria. Spectacular event indeed and beautiful horses. Time for another break. Newsline continues afterwards. Stay tuned.